my friends, let us not forget that we are in, <clears throat> sorry, my friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. By and large, American politics is dominated by politicians who build their careers on immoral compromises and ally themselves with open forms of political, economic, and social exploitation. There are exceptions, of course. We salute those. But what political leader can stand up and say, my party is the party of principles? To those who have said, be patient and wait, we have long said that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jails over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom, and we want it now. We do not want to go to jail, but we will go to jail if this is the price we must pay. <coughs> but we will go to jail if this is the price we must pay for love, brotherhood, and true peace. I appeal to all of you to get into this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village, and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes. Until the revolution of 1776 is complete, we must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. John Lewis, March on Washington, 1963. Good evening, and welcome to the Great Hall at Cooper Union. My name is Laura Sparks, and I was incredibly honored to become president of Cooper Union in January. Tonight, we are incredibly honored to welcome John Lewis, U.S. Representative of the 5th Congressional District of Georgia and a civil rights icon. A few moments ago, you heard the timeless words of John Lewis as spoken by Alfred R. Dudley III. Alfred is a Cooper Union junior in the School of Art. He's also the president of Cooper's Black Student Union. Thank you, Alfred, for that beautiful reading. As you, as you may notice from your program, tonight is the keynote event of a three-night series exploring the black American experience with a focus on artistic and print interpretations. Tomorrow evening here at 6.30, Juliana Jules Smith will discuss Afrocentric, her comic series exploring the experiences of four college students of color. Jules created Afrocentric as a way to challenge students and readers alike about the presumptions around race, class, gender, and sexuality through character dialogue. And on Saturday night, also here at 6.30, Cooper alumni William Villalongo and Mark Thomas Gibson will discuss Black Pulp, a traveling exhibition that they co-curated that examines the evolving, practice, the evolving perspectives of black identity in American culture and history through rare historical printed media and contemporary art. I think they're all here with us this evening. Jewel Smith, Mark Thomas Gibson, William Villalongo, will you all stand up and allow us to recognize you? We hope many of you will join us for each of these events as they represent a mixture of civic dialogue, social commentary, and artistic expression that truly reflects the spirit of Cooper Union. So back to tonight's speaker. For me to completely run through Congressman Lewis's resume in public office would take up half of our time here this evening and to thoroughly summarize key events leading up to his life uh, in public office, well, that would probably take up the second half. So let me just quickly highlight some of the most impressive and influential aspects of his remarkable journey as an activist, as a leader, as an agent for positive social change. John Lewis grew up on his family's farm in Alabama. As a boy, he attended segregated schools, and as a young man, he experienced the civil rights movement rising around him. He witnessed the Montgomery bus boycott and listened intently to the words of Reverend Martin Luther King on the radio. Before long, John Lewis had joined this movement. 
As a student at Fisk University, he organized lunch counter sit-ins. He participated in the freedom rides across the South to, prote to protest bus segregation. And he led influential student nonviolent coordinating committee. In 1963, at the age of 23, John Lewis helped to organize and delivered a keynote speech at the historic March on Washington. In 1965, he helped to spearhead a march of more than 600 peaceful protesters, including Dr. King, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. As most of you know, this march turned violent when Alabama state troopers attacked protesters. John Lewis was badly beaten and arrested at Selma, but that did not stop or even dampen his commitment to the civil rights movement. The organizing and nonviolent protests of John Lewis and others helped to accelerate the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but his work was far from done. And he continued to advocate for minority voting rights as a private citizen for 15 more years. Uh, remember, that's the abbreviated summary that I'm giving, and we're only up to 1980. Uh, in 1981, uh, John Lewis was elected to the Atlanta City Council, and five years later, he was elected to Congress, where he has served for the last 30 years. During this time, he has risen in seniority and influence while serving as a voice of reason and a model of integrity. He is currently Senior Chief Deputy Whip for the Democratic Party and a member of the House Ways and Means Committee. For his tireless efforts and courage, John Lewis has received many awards and honors, including the Medal of Freedom awarded to him in 2011 by President Barack Obama. Tonight, I look forward to hearing from and learning from Congressman Lewis. He'll offer some remarks and then engage in conversation with us. Certainly, his voice will be at home here. The Great Hall has been a setting for civil discourse for more than 150 years from Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass to Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, from garment workers seeking fair pay and safe working conditions to the early organizers of the NAACP. The Great Hall has hosted influencers, policymakers, and agents of change and social progress. Peter Cooper, the founder of this great institution, set the tone for this when he opened the Great Hall and founded Cooper Union in 1859. He believed education should be available to all, regardless of economic status, race, or gender. So <clears throat> he also encouraged an open dialogue, an inquisitive approach to life. And that's something that to this day, we strive to uphold in the Great Hall and in Cooper Union classrooms every single day. We're proud to host events like this, and we hope you'll join us for many future ones. We also greatly appreciate the support of donors who make the, these essential public programs possible and accessible to all. This was an event that was free and open to the public. Um, so my sincere thanks goes to the Serdna Foundation tonight for their recent grant to advance our Great Hall programming as an important civic resource here in New York uh, and broadcast all over the country. Their mission of seeding new ideas to advance social change is certainly at home here in the Great Hall. Uh, please note that we are also reaching beyond the Great Hall tonight by live streaming this event on YouTube so that people across the country can tune into this evening's conversation. So it would not be rude if you wanted to take out your phone for a few seconds now to text any friends or family who might be interested in joining us remotely tonight. They can visit youtube.com slash the Cooper Union. We are in the midst of extraordinary times today, socially and politically. Partisanship is high, while cooperation is low. And it seems as if people are not listening to each other. It seems as if few people in power are thinking clearly and deeply. So tonight, let's listen to the wisdom and experience of John Lewis, and let's think about the ways in which we can act to improve this amazing country in which we live. It is my humble and sincere honor to welcome Congressman John Lewis.
Madam President, that's not good to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President, for those kind words of introduction. I must tell you that I'm delighted, very happy, and very pleased to be here in the Great Hall. To be here in this very special place to see each and every one of you. Some of you heard me say that uh, I didn't grow up in a big city like New York, or Buffalo, or Syracuse, <laughs> or Albany, <laughs> or Detroit, or Philadelphia, or Atlanta, or Montgomery, or Selma. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little town called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four. How many of you remember when you were four? <laughs> That's pretty good, but what happened to the rest of us? In 1944, my father had saved $300, and a man sold him 110 acres of land. We still own this land today. <laughs> On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I don't eat too many peanuts today. I ate so many peanuts when I was growing up, I just don't want to see any more peanuts. Sometimes you would get on a flight flying from Atlanta to Washington, or Washington back to Atlanta, and the flight attendant tried to give you some peanuts. I said, no, thank you. I just don't care for any peanuts. But I tell you, growing up on that farm, I would be out there working in the field and pulling corn, picking cotton, gathering peanuts. And my mother would say, boy, you're falling behind. You need to catch up. You need to do your work. And I would say, this is hard work. And she would say, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> well, as a little child, as a little boy, I would get up early in the morning with my book bag, hide under the front porch and wait for the school bus to come up the hill. And I would run out and get on the school bus. I didn't like working in that field out in the hot sun. But growing up there, we raised chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens. Some of you probably heard the story from time to time. The story is true. I fell in love with raising chickens. Any of you know anything about raising chicken? Oh, some of you like to eat chicken, right? but you don't know anything about raising chicken. What, sir, why don't we compare notes here? <laughs> well, well, let me tell you what we had to do as, as a little boy. When the setting hen was set, you marked the fresh egg with a pencil. You placed them under the setting hen and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you placed them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more fresh eggs. I had to be able to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? So when these little chicks were hatched, I would fool these setting hen. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, Encouraged to send here and they're still in the nest for another three weeks. When I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. <laughs> it was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. It was not the democratic thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher 
from the Sister Roebuck store. Uh, does some of you remember the Sister Roebuck catalog? Or you don't know anything about it because you grew up in a big city? <laughs> oh, it's a big book, heavy book, thick book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. <laughs> so I just kept on wishing and kept on cheating on this setting here. But as a little boy, about eight or nine years old, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So with the help of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and cousins would lie on the outside of the chicken yard. And I would start speaking or preaching. And when I look back on it, some of the chicken would bow their heads. Some of the chicken would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. <laughs> but I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that. But I remember my first nonviolent protest before I heard of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. when my mother and father wanted to have a chicken for a meal. I didn't cooperate, refused to eat. I boycotted the meal. But I, I got over that. <laughs> but in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the radio. I followed the drama of the Montgomery bus boycott. The action of Rosa Parks, the leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way. But when I would ask my mother, ask my father, my grandparents, and others about those signs that said, white men, Colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, color waiting. They always told me, don't get in trouble. Don't get in the way. But I was inspired to get in the way, to get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. <laughs> so in 1957, 17 years old, getting ready to graduate from high school. I wrote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a letter. I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my brothers or sisters, any of my teachers. I told Dr. King I wanted to attend a little school 10 miles from my home called Troy State College, now known as Troy University. Submitted my application, my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the school. Dr. King wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. In the meantime, I decided to go off to school in Nashville, Tennessee. An uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had, gave me a footlocker. I put everything that I owned, a few books, my clothing, everything except those chickens in that footlocker and took a Greyhound bus to Nashville, Tennessee. And after being in Nashville for about three weeks, we started studying the way of peace, studying the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Be sitting in at a lunch counter, on a stool, at a table, and someone would come up and spit on us, or put a lighted cigarette out in our hair, or down our backs, pour hot water, hot coffee. We would continue to sit in an orderly fashion. And we were told that if we continue to sit in, we would be arrested. There was a young white minister by the name of Will Campbell, who was born in Mississippi. He was seen playing ping pong with a black person. He was fired from his job. He moved to Nashville. 
and became a real leader for civil rights, social change, for justice, he informed us that we would definitely be arrested. And I made up my mind. I had what I call an executive session with myself. <laughs> that if I were going to get arrested and go to jail, I wanted to look fresh. <laughs> I wanted to look sharp. I wanted to look what guys back then called clean. So I went to a used men's store in downtown Nashville and bought a suit. And a vest came with the suit. I paid $5 for it. And when I was arrested on that day, February 27th, 1960, I felt free. I felt liberated. If I had that suit tonight, I probably could sell it on eBay for a lot of money. <laughs> so since the sit ins, we have come a distance. We made a lot of progress, but we still have a distance to go before we redeem the soul of America and move closer to the creation of the beloved community. But we should appreciate the distance we've come. Just think a few short years ago, the same year that President Barack Obama was born. In 1961, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a Greyhound bus, trailway bus, leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, without being arrested, jailed, beaten, or left bloody. Thirteen of us were the original Freedom Riders. i never forget it. A little town called Rocky, South Carolina. My seatmate was a young white gentleman from Connecticut. The two of us attempted to enter a so-called white waiting room. Members of the Klan beat us, left us in a pool of blood. The local police officials came up, wanted to know whether we wanted to press charges. We said no. We come with love. We believe in the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Many years later, one of the guys who beat us came to my office in Washington in February of 09, less than a month after President Obama had been inaugurated. He was in the 70s, came with his son in his 40s, and he said, Mr. Lewis, a reporter in South Carolina told me where you could be located. He said, I want to apologize. Will you forgive me? His son started crying. He started crying. They hugged me. I hugged them back. And the three of us cried some more together. I saw this gentleman four other times. It's the power of the way of peace. It's the power of the way of love. We were not out to destroy any individual, but to destroy the system of segregation, racial discrimination, and destroy hate. <laughs> what we must continue to do is to educate the young, inspire children, our young people, to stand up, to speak up. And when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, do something about it. Make a little noise. We must inspire our students. 
in grade school, in middle school, in high school, in college, that they have a moral obligation to participate and not just stand on the sideline. We must say in the academic community that we have a role to play. I love the arts. Drawing, painting, I love music. If it hadn't been for the arts, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Images, go to music like songs like "Go Down Moses, Way Down in the Egypt Land," "Till O Pharaoh to Let My People Go." I woke up this morning with my, my mind staying on freedom. Which side are you on, boy? When you feel something, you should show some sign. Now more than ever before, we have to be hopeful. We have to be optimistic. And we cannot be down. We got to run the race. We got to save our country. We must do it. We all can do it. So tonight, in spite of getting arrested and going to jail a few times, my last arrest, as I've said so many times during recent weeks and months, for trying to get the Speaker of the House to bring forth a comprehensive immigration reform bill. The Speaker had brought that bill to the floor. Almost every single Democratic member would have voted for it, and enough Republican would have crossed over. We would have passed it, and President Obama would have signed it into law. It doesn't make sense for hundreds and thousands and millions of people to be living here in fear, and especially young children. <laughs> we need to set people on a path to citizenship. I don't want to build walls. I don't want to divide people. We need to be a bridges, bridges of understanding. When the final analysis, we're one family, we're one people, we all live in the same house, not just the American house, but the world house. As Dr. King put it, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. If not, we will perish as fools. And we must see that all of our people, all of our citizens, all of our fellow human beings have health care. <laughs> so all of us must be prepared to stand up, speak up, speak out, and agitate. The Reverend Ralph Abernathy one of the leaders with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the Montgomery bus boycott would tell a story from time to time about the agitator. He said, just look at the washing machine. He said, in effect, that we were modern day agitators. We were stirring up the dirt and the filth and bringing it out in the open to cleanse our society. And that's what we all must continue to do. The force of trying to make it harder, more difficult for people to participate. And for people die for the right to vote. Three young men that I knew, two from the city, this city from New York, that I met in 1964, Andy Goodman, 
Nika Schroener, white, Shane Shaney, African-American from Mississippi. They went out on the summer night of June 21st, 1964, to investigate the burning of an African-American church to be used for a voter registration workshop. These three young men, detained by the sheriff, taken to jail, later taken out of the jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. They didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East, or Eastern Europe, or Central South America, or in Africa. They died right here. And then we still have people saying, we're not going to let more people get to register to vote. We're going to make it harder. We're going to make it more difficult. In a democracy such as ours, the vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful, nonviolent instrument or tool we have, and we must use it. Teach our children, teach the young to use it. We need to see more women, more young people, more minorities involved in American politics. Running for office, use social media, get out there and do it, and you can do it. We need you now more than ever before. Smart, yes. Talk, run, yes. But we need you to put your name on the line and help save this republic of ours, the generation yet unborn. So thank you very much tonight. Thank you. Are we on? Are we on? Yeah. Thank you. So much of what you have done as an activist is to challenge those who are in power. But power can come in so many different forms. So I'm curious, and I know this group is too, what does power mean to you? Power is the ability to change things. to say, this is what we want, this is what we need, and this is what we're going to get. You have to be insistent, persistent, and never, ever give up. I think sometimes it's too easy for us to say, oh, that's too hard. That is really tough. But you've got to get out there and push and pull the ability it can come with just making a speech, yes, writing an article, or just being you. Sometimes you're present. Sometimes you have what I call moral power. And, and we shouldn't try to hide it. We should use it for good. So Cory Booker said in his piece about you for Time Magazine's 10 Most Influential People that leadership isn't a title or a position, but a way of life. Tell us what that means to you. Well, I was flattered that Cory Booker would write such about me. Um, it's, um, no, I, I never, uh, for me, you don't go around in a sense such and to be called this or, or that, or be appointed to this committee, to this board. 
Just be you. Just be yourself. Let your presence, your being. I think people recognize when someone is bearing witness to the truth. Um, when a certain person jumped on me because I said something, uh, the people in, uh, in, in, in my district and, and people all around America rally and say, well, apparently he just, he, he's not aware of the person. And it's my understanding because of what happened a, a movement of people started buying my books and they're shipping them to the White House. <laughs> That's power. So in my introduction, I said that um, partisanship is high and cooperation is low, that it seems like people aren't listening to each other. Um, and it's not just in Congress. It's on campuses. It's around the kitchen table. Um, it's in everyday life, it seems people aren't listening to each other. And many people seem like they're checking out. We hear people saying, I can't watch the news anymore, it's too much. Um, or nothing can happen in Washington anymore. Government can't do anything. So how do people stay activated in a time like this when the things that you have fought so hard for seem like they're under attack? Well, I, I try to encourage people. I said, just be a little, be a little more human. Don't let anything get you down. Be happy. I like the happy song, and every so often I play it and I dance to it. <laughs> Just it, we it should have had that playing here. Yeah. I would have well, liked to have seen that. No, sometimes when I'm speaking someplace, the you know, Union Hall or some group, they know I love the song and they, s and they play it, and I get the whole audience, you know, hundreds and thousands of people <laughs> dancing to happy. You know, and it, but. In the Congress, oh, I speak to people. I, I speak to everybody. Um, I remember w on one occasion when I first got to Washington, I was walking down Independence Avenue toward uh, the Capitol building, Kenner House office building, and I said, good morning to a gentleman. It was eye contact. And he said, why are you saying good morning to me? I don't know you. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, uh, I grew up in Alabama. I went to school in Tennessee. And I live in Georgia. I'm a southerner. And we believe in speaking to everybody. <laughs> so then he recognized me, and he apologized. So it was OK. But in the Congress, I walk up to members. They can be Democrat. They can be Republican. They can be liberal. They can be conservative. And I said, how you doing, sister? How you doing today, brother? Uh, and it sort of created this sort of family atmosphere. Uh, there's two members from the great state of New York that I really, really love, and I don't want to get them in trouble. But they're, but they're good friends, wonderful friends. And one is a real, real buddy. Uh, I know I'm getting her in trouble, I shouldn't do it. Um, but I call her sister. Um, and just the nicest, the smartest person you want to ever meet. Um, she's from outside of the city. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this, but you have a great delegation on our side of the aisle, just wonderful. Just beautiful, soulful people, and they, uh, they're just wonderful. And, and we have fun. Uh, we talk. We, we eat together from time to time. And you learn a great deal about someone when you break bread with them. Have a meal. So, so there was a lot of news this winter about your boycotting the inauguration. How do you think about the distinction between participation and resistance? What is the role of resistance? Well, it's, you have to make what I call a moral decision. 
that you see something that is not right, are you going to cooperate with it? The teaching of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Thoreau, I guess we call it the philosophy of non-cooperation. That in, in, at different stage in a movement, we have what we call a selected bind campaign. Uh, we have a, a boycott where we draw our, not just our financial support, but our moral support. And because it was not planned, it was not planned, Chuck Todd was interviewing me for me to press in my office. And he asked a question. But I, I said, no, I'm not going to attend. And almost 70 other members followed. And I th there were some members saying, because what he said to our friend, John Lewis, we cannot be a party to this. You, you, you have to be satisfied in your own mind, in your own being, that this is the right thing to do. You cannot butcher your conscience. You cannot be part of something. You cannot endorse something or person that you think is not real. So you have to withdraw your moral support or your presence or your being. So we're in the Great Hall at the Cooper Union, and the Cooper Union, I think as you know, has schools of art and architecture. So clearly, visual storytelling is important to us here. But I'm curious, what made you choose a graphic novel as a route to tell your story? Well, when I was very young, not that young, but about 17 and a half, uh, I came across uh, a comic book in the South and other parts of our country, people call it funny book. That's a funny book. That's not a real book. <laughs> but it was a comic book, colorful, beautiful. It was called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Story. 16 pages. It sold for 10 cents. This little comic book became like a road map, a blueprint. It taught us all about the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Taught us about what Rosa Parks did and the role she played. Taught us about Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King, when we did the research, have edited the book. Can you believe that Martin Luther King Jr. sitting down at a kitchen table using pencil or pen to edit a comic book? <laughs> but he did. And that little book inspired action all over America, especially in the American South. And many young people reading it today. And so one of my staff people came to me. Um, it was happening out in my re-election in 08. And people started saying, what are you going to do? The campaign is over. What are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to a comic book convention. Everybody started laughing. And I said, don't laugh. That was a comic book during the movement. And it changed my life. So he kept on pleading with me, Congressman, you should write a comic book. You should write a and I said, oh, maybe. He said, for politician, that's a good way of saying no. <laughs> and, and, and he wouldn't give up. And I finally said, I would do it if you do it with me. So there's hundreds and thousands of young people all over America are reading it. And it's been translated. It's in uh, French and Italian. And a few days ago, it was the best-selling book in Italy. Right. Yeah. 
So our student, Alfred, read excerpts from your 1963 March on Washington speech, uh, but it sounded like those words could have been written today. When President Barack Obama left office, he characterized the 2016 election as, quote, a comma in the continuing story of building America. From a civil rights perspective, do you agree? Is this a comma, a pause, or is it a regression? I agree with President Barack Obama. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a mix of, of both, I should say. But I'm convinced deeply in my bones that there may be some setbacks, some disappointments, um, interruptions, but we will get there. We will build that beloved community. We will redeem the soul of America. And we will not be a walls between our people. We will not. We will do everything to bring people together as one people, as one family, not just the American family, but the world family. I believe that. So we're gonna, cl we're gonna close with one last question. Um, we are in the very room where Lincoln stated right makes might. How do we return a country to one that shares that similar understanding of basic human decency? What is the progressive path forward for people in this country who care about civil rights and liberties? I, I think this place, this place, this hall may be the right place, the place we should have some of the, the great debates on where we're going as a nation, as a people. Do we want to go back or do we want to go forward? Do we want to see those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting? We should maybe This institution could be, it could play that role. <laughs> and, and, and maybe some of us could dress up like Lincoln. <laughs> uh, we can cosplay and uh, But we, 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 need, we, we need to use drama. We need to use images and symbols. When I first moved to Atlanta, and became a member of um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s father's church. I would go there from time to time. And young Martin Luther King Jr. would be preaching, and his father would be in the audience or maybe in the pulpit. And while his son was preaching, my daddy king would say, make it plain, son, make it plain. We need to find ways to make it plain. Make it plain. So some of you know that uh, the congressman and I met on a train uh, on our way to D.C., uh, we hadn't met before, and I heard his voice and saw the way in which he was engaging with people on the train. Um, and really, I think, inspired so many people on that train, as you do every day, to remind us that good things can happen in Washington, that there are people there who take seriously the lives of everyday people and try to create policy and construct policy that will make this country an even better place. Um, and on that train, I asked the congressman if he would come speak in the Great Hall, and I think I heard just now in your comments about what the Cooper Union can be uh, an offer to perhaps come back as part of a series of debates. Well, thank you. Well.
Well, uh, Madam President, uh, you, you invite me to come back. You know, I will come back and I will play myself. I, I will dress up like I was dressed on that bridge, March 7, 1965. I will have my light trench coat on, my, my backpack, and in the backpack I will have my apple, an orange, two books, toothpaste, and toothbrush. And uh, I would love to come back. So thank you. Well, it has been such an honor to have you here tonight, to have you representing us. Um, and on behalf of Cooper Union, I want to thank you so much for being here. There's an open invitation. We would be so grateful to have you back anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.